Hi everyone, um, welcome to our, our video podcast. Today we're joined by uh, City of Kenmore Mayor Nigel Herbig. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, do you want to start with a little light introduction of who you are? Uh, yeah, so um, I grew up in the Seattle area. I grew up, down, grew up down in Seattle, went through Seattle Public Schools, graduated from the University of Washington, and then my family and I moved out to Kenmore when we were looking for something that was a little bit more affordable than Seattle. Uh, so we purchased out here 16, 17 years ago now. And um, I'm somebody, I had been working in politics since the Howard Dean campaign. Um, I read an article on The Stranger about this governor from Vermont who was running for president. So I started volunteering in that campaign and then I got hired on there. And um, I really saw the power that politics has to make people's lives better. Um, I view government is how we make the investments that we can't make by ourselves, right? Uh, we can't build our own road, right? We can't, you know, put together our own school system or whatever. I mean, I guess some folks can, but uh, but it's how we make those big investments together. So government and politics is how you make sure that the right investments are being made, I think. And so I've worked in politics going back to 2003 now. Um, and after we moved to Kenmore, um, I realized that my condo was, you know, kitty corner from the brand new city hall after it was built. And being that I was interested in politics anyway, I started just coming across the street when they were having meetings and seeing what was happening with my local government. Um, at the time, I was working, I think, in a congressional race or something like that. But um, I started coming across the street and watching the council meetings and got interested in what was happening here locally. And um, then, and and. <laughs> I started off actually by, um, I would come to the meetings, they just built this new building here, um, and they weren't live streaming the meetings. And this was like 2011, 2012. Live streaming was a thing that was relatively easy to do at the time. Um, maybe not as easy as it, as it is now, but it was still relatively easy. And so I set up a Twitter account uh, at Kenmore Politics and started live tweeting the meetings. You know, I just come into my laptop, sit in the back, look up to the Wi-Fi, and start live tweeting. Because there are a lot of folks who, you know, it's hard for for everybody who is interested to make it down to City Hall, you know, at 7 o'clock on Monday. People are busy. People are making dinner. People have kids that are working on homework. We have a lot of stuff going on. So it's hard for folks to make it down. So I actually got a few hundred followers that would, you know, um, reply to me in the middle of a meeting, asking a question what was going on, things like that. And um, then after maybe a year, year and a half of doing that, um, I was meeting with the deputy mayor at the time, and he told me he wasn't going to be running for re-election. And I said, Bob, we're going to need to find somebody to run for your seat. And he said, well, I'd endorse you if you wanted to run. And can't say I thought about it all that much, but um, I did some research and then jumped into the race, and that was back in 2015. So I'm in my been on council now for about ten and a half years. Um, the last two and a half as mayor, and four years um, in the middle of that as deputy mayor. So, what does the city council do? What is and how does that differ from your job as the mayor? So, um, we have a form of government called a council manager form of government, which is different than what you see in some other cities. Like a lot of people think of when they think of mayor, they think of like the mayor of Seattle, right? He runs the city. That's his job. I am a council member with a better title, essentially. I am a member of the council, and I essentially chair the meetings. I do the ceremonial stuff, like, you know, I, I get a big pair of scissors for cutting ribbons, like when we open yeah. up the bridge, or things like that. I, um, you know, in this face of the city, when it comes, like, if there's a question from the press about something, that I'm the <clears throat> official spokesperson for the city, that sort of thing. But I'm just a member of the council with a better title. I, I, I joke that I'm a council member who gets a gavel, and a big pair of scissors, and that's really the difference. Um, and I view my job as really just facilitating the meetings and really trying to get seven people to all kind of come to a consensus and try to make decisions to move things forward. So with that said, um, what the council does is we uh, pass and control of the budget for the city. We also pass a lot of the high-level policies for the city. Um, and then we have a city manager who works for the council. Uh, his name is Rob Carlinzi. Um, lives in Kenmore, and he runs the day-to-day -day operations of the city, but he reports directly to the council. So he takes direction from us, he carries out our vision, and it's kind of an interesting form of government. A lot of people don't, I didn't frankly understand it until I moved to Kenmore and started coming to the meetings, um, but from a council standpoint, it's kind of nice because there isn't a tension between the executive and 
the legislative branch because the executive works directly, the city manager works directly for the council. So he has every reason to carry out what we ask him to do versus, um, you know, you can look to Seattle as an example, but in previous years they've had issues where the council wanted to do one thing, the mayor didn't want to do it, and the council can't direct the mayor to do anything, and so they would kind of butt heads and have disagreements and not be able to get things done. We don't have that sort of tension between our city manager and the council because he is our employee. So, so what have been some of your favorite things that um, either you as mayor or the city council as a whole has been able to accomplish? Yeah, so when I first ran in 2013, my biggest uh, issue was sidewalks and bike lanes. You know, we hadn't been incorporated all that long when I first ran. We got incorporated in 98. And up until then, we were part of unincorporated King County. So King County, you know, was doing their best, but also they weren't investing a lot of, um, they weren't investing a lot of the infrastructure out in their unincorporated areas because they don't have money for that. Uh, and so we have a lot of catch up to do uh, when it comes to basic things like sidewalks and bike lanes. And I'm really proud of, since, since I've been elected, and I'm not claiming credit for all of this, but since I've been elected, we have built somewhere between six, seven plus miles of sidewalk and, um, and as much, and actually probably twice as much bike lane over the last 10 years. Um, and we've seen improvements in safety around that because, and also you get more people out walking around, which I think is nice. When I, you know, when I first moved here, there wasn't a sidewalk on 68th, right where we are outside city hall. Um, so just basic infrastructure like that is something I'm really proud of. I mean, I lived off of um, Juanita, and I remember the construction there for the, the bike lanes and everything. It was it was like a long period of construction, yeah. But I would I would say that it was probably worth it just because now I can go out there and just see people riding their bikes, see people walking up and down the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. I felt bad when I in 2017, no 2021 when I was up for re-election, that was supposed to be done by the end of the year. So I was door knocking right off of Juanita, like by Arrowhead. And I was talking to families whose kids are going to Arrowhead Elementary, and they're like, when is this thing going to be done? And I checked our website. I said it was going to be done by the end of the year. didn't get done for the year after that. Um, we had some issues with the contractor, uh, which were unfortunate. But it all got done, and it's a massive improvement. And that is something I know that, you know, this sort of work can be a little painful to go through in the short run. In the long run, it's made mercy a, a, a better place to live and a safer place to live. Yeah. Um. So what would you say to young people like ourselves who are interested in getting involved more in the local community, whether or not that's having an official position or um, just looking to advocate more? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do that. We have, you know, from the extreme example of, say, our current council member, Nathan Lutzis, who got on the planning commission when he was 17 and then uh, got elected to city council at 21. That is one route you can go if, if, uh, if you know, you have that level of commitment. But also, we just need to hear from young folks at our council meetings about the issues we're working on. Um, because it's not a, it's just not a perspective we get a lot of, to be honest. Uh, we hear a lot from folks who have lived here for a long time, from, um, you know, older folks generally. Um, I don't mean older, older, but I mean older than you. And, you know, we need to be hearing from, from, from young folks. And there's other ways to be involved too. The city of Kenmore has a lot of volunteer opportunities. A lot of internship opportunities, and those are worth looking into. I think um, I know, you know, from talking to Nathan Councilman Lutz, you know, he had done some internships or had done some summer work for like a public works department at one point. Um, so there are there are opportunities in the community to get involved. Um, but I would say, you know, look at what the city government's doing, and find places where it impacts your life because local government, I think, has a bigger impact on the day-to-day -day life of most people than, you know, the federal government where everybody paid, where all of the ink is spilled and everybody's paying attention to it. And I get it. It's the big thing. It's, it's exciting. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. But at the local level, we're building parks. We're, we're building sidewalks. We're putting in, you know, um, safer crossings. We are doing all sorts of work that affects people's day-to-day -day life. And I would really encourage folks to take the time to, to, to get involved and follow what's going on at the local level because I think, frankly, it's, it's more impactful on a day-to-day -day, um, basis than a lot of what kind of you hear of in the news with politics. But I'm curious, how closely does, you know, Kenmore work with the state and federal levels? Yeah, we work pretty closely. We have, um, 
we have state and federal lobbyists who are uh, carry out, you know, like we have a state lobbyist um, whose job it is we pass a legislative um, agenda, usually later in the year, because legislative sessions start in January. So we'll pass a legislative agenda usually in the fall. And then her job is to go and talk to our delegation that represents Kenmore, but also to talk to other uh, important lawmakers, uh, maybe on the committees that impact uh, what we're asking for. So we usually have a couple um, specific uh, money asks, like we might be asking for culvert money for a culvert that needs to get replaced, or sidewalk money for a sidewalk that needs to get redone, or maybe we're asking for money for a public works facility that we're currently getting the funding put together for. Um, and then we'll have some policy areas that we might be asking them to emphasize and work on also. So last year we asked them to, you know, work on, uh, we knew there should be work on automated traffic cameras, which are something that we found have been really effective for increasing safety in our kind of school zones. Another area, that, area though, that we'd like to expand that to, or at least look at, is um, uh, the bus lanes on 522. We have bus rapid transit coming in in a couple of years, and part of what makes bus rapid transit work is that it's is that it's predictable, it's fast, and it's rapid, and people don't have to worry about getting stuck in traffic. And the last thing we want is once that goes in, is then to have people cheating in the carpool lanes, in in, in the HOV lanes, uh, in the bus lanes, and um, and slowing down transit. Transit carries a lot more people, you know, a bus full of people is moving a lot more folks than the lane full of single cars, right? So we'll make sure those are moving. And so that was one issue that we gave for our lobbyists and they worked to make sure that we would be able to, if we wanted to, in a couple of years, once um, the bus rapid transit starts going in, that we could put in cameras to enforce, um, enforce that. That's just one example. But we work pretty close with them. We also do have, like I mentioned, we have federal lobbyists that are in D.C. and as things pop up there, you know, if we're having to work with, say, the Army Corps of Engineers, which has like jurisdiction over a big chunk of the Sammamish River and parts of like Washington, if we have an issue with them, then we'll have our federal lobbyists um, go and meet with the Army Corps of, Corps of Engineers or meet with our congressional delegation to help us work through issues that, we'll, that we have that are impacting say the lake and the river. And is there anything about light rail in Kenmore? Because I know public transit in America, other than you know buses, is, is extremely difficult. Yeah. So is, is there any like progress or is there going to be any like like improvements or like additions to the light bulb system currently? Uh, um, not currently. There is, I believe, when Sound Transit 3 was passed, that um, that 522 was put into a study area for possible future light rail expansion. In the meantime, we're already in the bus rapid transit, which will be running, I think, every 10 minutes and will be super predictable and fast and all of that. Not the same as light rail, but it's going to be as good as we're going to get for now. So they are studying on what it would take to put light rail down 522. I think it is an next logical option for like ST4 or ST5 down the line uh, to connect, say, the Roosevelt or Northgate stations through Bothell, you know, up Lake City Way through Bothell, and then either connect with, um, yeah, you know, maybe make it all the way to Redmond and connect with the Redmond line. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, but that's you know, going to be probably decades down the line, unfortunately, with how slow we are with, with these investments, which I think is a, it's unfortunate how, how long we take these things. Um, I'm kind of interested, you mentioned um, the improvements with transportation and things like that. Um, when it comes more to like the speeding cameras and, and those sort of things, how do you guys as city council work with the police force? Is there any sort of collaboration there? Well, I mean, we... So we contract with the King County Sheriff's Office for our police. So they are King County Sheriff's, um, they're the King County Sheriff's Department, and then we contract with them and we, you know, have some amount of control over that. Uh, the chief of, um, of the Kenmore Police Department reports to both our city manager and he reports over to the King County Sheriff and has to follow policies for both. So we do have a really close relationship with them. Um, they have been very supportive of the speed cameras that we've uh, put in. Um, so we put in one by Arrowhead on Juanita. We put one over by Kimball Elementary over on 73rd. Um, those are the two we have active right, well not active right now, but those are the two that we have going. They're only on during school, um, during school times, before and after school and during the school year. Um, and they've been wildly effective to be honest. 
us. I mean, you can, we had a really good presentation a few weeks ago from our traffic engineer who went through all the statistics on it. And it's really surprising to see, you know, you can put up signs and a certain number of people will slow down just based on signs. You can put in the sign saying you're going this fast, you know, and a certain number of people will slow down. You make you tie it to a ticket and you get 99% compliance. It's wild how quickly it works. Uh, once it hits people's pocketbook, they slow down. And they should. Uh, we know there are so many studies showing the tie between speed and the severity of, of um, injuries to folks that are hit by cars. And even the difference between 20 and 25, it can be pretty pretty big. And once you get above 25 and 30, um, you know, you're going from injuries to like possible death and things like that. So we do know that the speed kills and um, especially around school zones, if we get people to follow the this, this school speed, that's a, that's a good thing. That, that is increasing safety. So, so um, other than the speeding and, and uh, speed cameras, what other things are you sort of looking for um, the city of Kenmore to improve on over the next couple of years? It's a good question. We've got a lot of things we've been working on for a while. Um, we are, I think a lot of the work we're doing is kind of continual work. Um, and this is just me speaking from kind of where I came from, but you know, having run on kind of pedestrian and bicycle safety, we still have a lot of work to do on that front. Um, we made massive improvements with the walkways and waterways bond measure where we were able to do the sidewalks and bike lanes, you know, down Juanita and up 68th. But there's still a lot of areas that we need to make improvements on. Uh, we're making big investments currently in our um, in our fish passages and our, our culverts to make sure that to try to make it so that fish out in the Washington actually make it up the streams. Uh, it's vitally important to our ecosystems um, that we're able to get fish back in, in Lake Washington and get them back into the city. And that's an ongoing thing. Uh, we're doing a big study right now on Swamp Creek to try to figure out where we can make the best investments along Swamp Creek, especially like behind the bowling alley, kind of running north, um, where we can make the best investments there to increase the health of the swamp because those areas do a lot of work for, um, for climate change. They suck up a bunch of carbon. There's a lot of wildlife tied up with that. So there's a lot of kind of ongoing work that we're going to have to continue around pedestrian safety and um, and water, frankly. Those are two big things we're going to have to continue working on. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of on that front right now. I think you guys should install a chair with the assignments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, what about uh, affordable housing? Kind of? Yeah. Is that a future program working on? Yeah, I mean, affordable housing is... I can't remember if it's our first or second council priority right now. It's kind of bounced between the two. Um, and it is an incredibly uh, important thing for the city. We are, as a state, dealing with a um, housing crisis, frankly, right now. We are, I heard the governor say this, and then I looked into it, but we are the least housed state in the country. We have less housing units per family unit than any other state in the and as much as people try to pretend the supply and demand, that somehow the real estate market is different, supply and demand is still incredibly important when it comes to housing. And we have not been building enough housing for the last 50 years throughout the entire region. Um, so there is a lot of work we have to do on that. So we're having discussions right now later this year around uh, missing middle housing to allow more different types of housing throughout the city, uh, triplexes, duplexes, things like that. And we're also making investments in affordable housing directly, uh, just two lots away from where we are in City Hall. There's the big empty lot um, right behind Safeway, big grass lot across the street yeah. from the back of Safeway. That's uh, We call it the whole property. And we purchased that a couple years ago uh, with, um, we purchased that a couple years ago, and we're working with Imagine Housing and Habitat for Humanity right now on a proposal that would build, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it would build, um, I think, 100 plus units of uh, rental housing affordable to people making 50% of the area median income. So, you know, half as much as the average family. And then it would also build a chunk of um, a handful of units for purchase uh, for families making 80% of area median income. So that's a place that, you know, we're, that's a project that is still getting worked on. There's a lot of work that has to, be, has to get done for that to make us a finish line. But that's an area where we're directly putting our money where our mouth is as far as affordable housing goes. 
But the other part that we need to do is expand the number of housing units around and more and the types of housing. Because not everybody needs a 3,000 square foot or 2,500 square foot single family house. People have a lot of other needs. And right now that's about 90%, 95% of our uh, residentially zoned areas is just exclusively for single family housing. Um, I mean, you can, we also have added in ADUs, but those are coming on, um, and those are sensory dwelling units, sorry. And those are coming on a little slow that we'd like also. But. So I, I know this is a, a tough question to answer, but um, what does the sort of like a timeline look like with a project that you're mentioning just a couple of blocks down? What is the obviously an estimate of a timeline there? I mean, it really depends on how things go. They usually take a couple of years out. Yeah. You have to gather together multiple streams of funding uh, from the feds, from the state, maybe from all sorts of places. And luckily, imagine Habitat the ones have to do that work. Um, <clears throat> we just have land that we'll sell them for a discounted price if everything else comes together. Um, but it usually takes a couple of years. And then once, and that's just to get to groundbreaking. And then once you get to groundbreaking, you're probably talking another year or two for um, for the units to actually be on the market and for things to open up. It takes longer than we like, but that's what we need to. That's what we need to be working really aggressively on it, um, and to continue to work aggressively because we're just such a we have such a deficit in housing right now that we have to kind of be grabbing every opportunity we can to get more housing. Um, I know. I mean, obviously, at a federal level, a lot of the election stuff's crazy right now. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. that's an understatement. But I've never looked at an election like this one. This is wild. <laughs> People still can't vote. You know? <laughs> um, and I think the uh, either it was King County or the state ballot just got sent out. Yeah. Um, yeah. What does at more of a city or like a city council level? When when are those elections happening? And what do people R H who can maybe at least register to vote? What do they need to know? Well, um, good luck. You'll be able to vote next year, so <laughs> that's good. Uh, so city elections are held in odd years. So like in even years like you know twenty twenty four, you've got the federal elections, and then you have like your state legislature and all of that. That's what's mainly on the ballot this year. In the odd years, you'll have city council races, county council races, and local things. So next year is where you're going to see um, see city council on the, on the ballot. Uh, there will be, I can't remember if it's three or four, it's usually it's one or the other every two years because half the council is up. So there'll be either three or four of us on the ballot ne and next year. Um, I see you on the ballot next year, um, along with one, two, three. Yeah, I think it might just be three of us on the ballot next year. Um, and they, we go through a primary, if more than two people, so we register, uh, to run for office in May. And then if more than two people register to run for the same office, then, um, then, you know, those three people or more will be put on the August primary ballot. And that's used to winnow it down to the top two. Okay. Those top two then go on to the November ballot. Uh, and then the winner there takes office in January. Of the following year, so. So, what would you suggest for students or people our age to do if they're interested in, in a career similar to yours? Yeah, I mean, find some find a candidate or a campaign that you care about and go volunteer. It's great, you know. When I volunteered on campaigns, it's a great way to meet lots of people. Um, you meet a wide variety of people and make a lot of connections that I think are really important for you down the road. Uh, you learn a lot. You know, campaigns are kind of everybody grabs what, what they can do and does it as best as they can. And it's usually, you know, held together by duct tape and bubble gum, you know, like you're just trying to do it as, as efficiently as you can. So it's a great learning experience uh, as far as just basic work experience, I think. And then also just building that network for later on in your career, still have those professional connections. Um, but find something you're passionate about. You know, maybe there's an initiative on the ballot that you care about. Or maybe there's a candidate that really inspires you. Like that's what got me into politics was the Howard Dean campaign. He really inspired me, um, and so I went working on that campaign. I'm still friends with people that I shared an office with 21 years ago. Um, it, you know, you create bonds in that sort of environment that you don't make elsewhere, or that you know you don't make in a lot of places. So um, I really think there's a lot of value in doing that. And so you can you know find the political party that aligns with you and ask them for volunteer opportunities, find a candidate that inspires you, find an initiative that you think is interesting, and there's always ways to get plugged in and, and do this sort of work. 
Is there anything else you have to say to our, to our audience or anyone who might be watching? Uh, vote. Um, you know, it's one of the most like sacred pieces of um, being a um, being a citizen that you've got. So use that tool. Uh, read the voter's guide. Reach out to candidates if you have questions. They usually have contact information in the voter's guide. Um, and be involved on that level because especially the local level, like I said, A, your vote counts for more at the local level. And B, it affects your day-to-day -day life more than any, more than state or federal um, elections do. And so get involved in, at a minimum vote. It's the easiest thing you can do. We make it as easy as possible, I should say. You don't you can put it back in the mail slot without a stamp, or you can run down to City Hall and drop it off. You can even come the last couple of days before the election is done, we'll have an election center in City Hall for folks. So we try to make it as simple as possible. All right, well, thank you very much. Do you have anything else for? That's it. Thank you All so right. much. Thank, thank you. you so much.